Technologists tend to adopt new technology pretty early and we tend to be open-minded to see how best it can help our patients. Um, if we find out that it helps, we're really good at using it. If we find out that it doesn't, we don't. We really do adopt technology well and I think we do it in order to streamline diagnosis and uh, proceed with as minimally invasive treatments as we can. My dad was a man who was ahead of his time, actually. He understood the value of a picture and, and the thousand words, if you will, that the picture could, could give you. Um, and so he, early in his career, uh, started taking pictures and then quickly transitioned into taking videos, uh, both in the office as well as in the operating room. And it was uh, for the purposes of one, documentation for the chart, see progression, two, education of the patient, and three, education for our residents. Once we figured out that the vocal folds are built in layers and work in layers, we realized that pathology develops in layers, and we had to develop surgical instrumentation that was more precise and allowed us to address pathology transgressing only the areas of the vocal fold that were already disturbed without traumatizing subjacent layers, damaging normal tissue, and provoking scar formation that obliterates the layered structure. So we've had major technological advances in instrument delicacy and precision. When I think back to my training and where we've come over the past you know, three decades with this technology and really think that these transnasal endoscopic intracranial procedures that are currently being performed as a routine part of our specialty is really amazing. In fact, sometimes I sit back and think about it and it's truly mind-boggling. That was the first cochlear implant, and they were, uh, they were almost treated like pariahs because it was just insane and unbelievable that somebody would just randomly put an electrode in the ear uh, and, and expect that that would work. One of the opportunities as editor-in-chief of our journals is that I'll see papers coming in that are referencing some of the newest and most exciting innovations in otolaryngology. I'd like to just comment on a few of those. One of the things we're seeing that I think is very exciting is advances in obstructive sleep apnea. The fact that we now have implantable devices that are able to assist patients who have severe obstructive sleep apnea so they don't have to wear CPAP masks. Another area that's been very exciting is the explosion of mobile technologies and the, and the opportunities we have for diagnosing and monitoring and treating patients at a distance. We published patient papers recently looking at mobile audiometry, the ability to really do high quality, accurate hearing tests at a distance. And what that can allow us is the ability to monitor patients in rural settings or patients that simply don't have access to care. We see these same kind of mobile applications using video devices. We're seeing a lot of work in the basic science end around stem cell regeneration, looking at the, the ability to, to generate hair cells for sensory neural hearing loss using stem cell technology. There have been some interesting papers recently that have looked at this and they're making incremental success in actually functional hair cells being regenerated. The applications are obvious in terms of assisting our patients with sensory neural hearing loss and regaining some, if not all, of their hearings. Mm -hmm.